Hello, students. Welcome back for our second and final day of notes for this topic, mammals. And if you recall, yesterday we talked about five characteristics of mammals. If you don't remember what they were, go back in your notes from yesterday and review them, study them. And also yesterday we discussed the three main groups of mammals and they all begin with the letter M. Make sure you remember those three words for the quiz on Friday. The monotremes, marsupials, and Does the third one begin with an M? I don't think so. The placental mammals. So two begin with an M, one begins with a P. All right, I'm just quizzing you. See if you were paying attention, making you question whether you wrote the right thing down yesterday or not. Yeah, so study your notes. Well, today we are going to be moving on from our friendly sloth. Friend from yesterday. And we're going to move on to the 10 groups of placental mammals. Because as you can imagine, not all placental mammals are the same. There are many differences between different placental mammals. And scientists, biologists in particular, have divided them basically into 10 groups or categories. So let's begin with number one, the insect eating mammals. And again, remember, these are all placental mammals. They include the star-nosed mole, the hedgehog, and the shrew. There are others as well, but these critters are noted for being voracious insect Eaters. Now I'm going to show you a picture that only a mother could love. Uh, are you? You know, let me tell you a little story before I show you this picture. Uh, long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, before I became a teacher, one of the many jobs I used to possess was being a field worker for the. New Jersey Division of Fish, Game, and Wildlife, the Non-Game and Endangered Species Program. In other words, I, I spent my summers uh, doing helping with research around the state of New Jersey on endangered and non-game species. Well, there was one year that I was doing a survey on the, uh, the painted turtle. Painted turtle? No, it wasn't a painted turtle. Oh, the bog turtle. The bog turtle. And I was setting up traps uh, around the state to determine the areas in which bog turtles lived. And so after we determined potential suitable habitats for bog turtles, we would set traps. Then I have to come back on a daily basis and check those traps to make sure that uh, we didn't kill anything because we were only trapping in live traps to take a survey of the critters that we would come up with. Well, this one day I came back to this trap and uh, there was not a turtle inside the trap. But and, and as I as I opened the trap and reached my hand in to remove the organism that got into my turtle trap, this is what I saw staring me in the face. Ah! This is a star-nosed mole. And I have to be honest with you, it was the first time I had ever seen a star-nosed mole in real life. And I got to be honest, it freaked me out a little bit. I, I thought maybe there was something wrong with it. So I snapped the picture of it and brought it back to my boss and said, hey, what in the world is this thing that I trapped today? And he's like, oh, that's a star-nosed mole. I'm like, wowie kazowie. Now that's a face I will never forget. But notice with this star-nosed mole and other moles for that matter, 
their claws are incredibly adapted to digging through moist soil areas in their environment in order to uh, uh, tunnel through the ground and find their prey, which are, well, little grubs and bugs. Now, under the ground, as you might imagine, there's not a lot of light and eyes are pretty much useless if you're going to be living under the ground most of your life. And so the star-nosed mole has developed this, uh, this interestingly shaped proboscis, its nose, with all of these chemical sensors on it, which enable it to not only find its way under the ground, but it funnels through the soil, searching for its prey that it detects with this star nose. It, it senses where its prey is, and it just digs like a demon through the soil in order to get to its prey and then gobbles it up. But I got to tell you, I, I never saw a creature like that before that day. And uh, that was my introduction at a pretty early age, that there is quite a variety of different species on planet Earth, and you never know what little critter you might uh, come face to face with one day, like the star-nosed mole. Whew, I'm just wondering, have any of you ever seen a star nosed mole before? It's become quite a star in my mind. All right, number two. The second group of placental mammals are also kind of unique because there are not many of them. They are the flying mammals. When we think of flying animals, we primarily think of birds or maybe insects. Generally, we don't think of mammals as flying unless they're on an airplane, perhaps. But uh, bats are mammals. Bats have skin-like membrane between their fingers, which form their wings. And their skeletal systems are so small and light that enables them to take flight. Flying squirrels are also an example, although flying squirrels don't truly fly. They're more like gliders. They glide. They have to climb up high and then they can glide down. They can't take off from the ground and fly up uh, and truly fly like bats do or birds for that matter. But again, we're talking about placental mammals. And I don't know if you've ever seen bats up close and personal before, but to me, they look like little ugly rats with really sharp teeth with wings, and they freak me out. They're, you know what? I'm just getting the willies just thinking about them because I, I have a story about bats, too. Uh, you know, normally uh, critters don't freak me out, but there are a few that just, you know, get under my skin. And uh, I got shivers just thinking about this. When I was about your age, I used to raise chickens. And at the end of each day, I'd go up to the chicken coop and I'd gather the eggs, bring them down to the kitchen, wash them up, put them in the fridge. And my mom would help me sell them uh, over the next couple of days to make some money to pay for the feed to feed the chickens so that I could gather their eggs. And it was a circle that went around. And around. I never really made a lot of money from it. Uh, it was just kind of they were like my pets. But anyway, this one day. I went up and I should have gone up earlier, I know, but I was delinquent in my chores that day. So it was later in the day. It was already getting dark. So I went up to the chicken coop and we had about, I had about two dozen chickens at that time. So I had a number of nests along the one wall inside and I didn't have any lights in there. I didn't incubate them at all. But I went up one night with my little basket, my little egg basket. And I had done it so many times that I didn't need a light. I just would reach into the nest, grab the eggs, put them in the basket, go to the next nest, do the same thing, and then come on back to the house, clean them up and all that good stuff. Well, this one night, it was dark, and I went into the first nest, got the eggs, put them in, got to the second nest, put my hand in, got the eggs, put them in the basket. I got to the third nest, and I reached in for the eggs. 
and I didn't feel an ache. I felt something furry. It was about the size of an egg, but it was not an egg. It was not covered with a shell. It was covered with fur. And as I reached in for it, I could feel this furry, egg-sized critter crawling up my arm towards my head out of the nest. And as it got out of the nest, it flew out and around the chicken coop because it was a bat. I had reached in the nest barehanded and grabbed a hold of a bat that ended up crawling up my arm and flying around and freaking me out. I was so freaked out that I have to be honest with you, I dropped the basket full of eggs and they shattered all over the place as I ran, and no offense ladies, but I screamed like a girl out of that chicken coop down to the house, and I was just so freaked out, it took me a while to calm down. Now, I knew in my mind that, you know, little fruit bats like the one we had that night, you know, they're, they're not out to get people. It's not like it was a vampire bat or anything like that. And, and bats are good, you know, around the yard. They eat bad bugs at night. And, and so, you know, bats by and large aren't bad things unless, of course, they have rabies and they bite you and you die. That's a bad thing. But it was just so unexpected and dark and dreary and creepy. And it was furry crawling up my leg. And oh man, I got to change the subject because the hair on the back of my head is standing up right now. I got the willies. I'm just, all right, moving on. Number three, whoo, flesh eating. Oh yeah, that's a better category, right? The flesh eating placental mammals include the walrus, the weasel, the cat, and the dog. All of these common uh, mammals are, in fact, flesh eating. Now, what does that mean? Well, they're carnivores. Carnivores. They eat meat, which is what flesh is. Number four. These are kind of interesting. Oh, I've got to move this a little bit out of the way. Forgive me here. There we go. That's a little bit better. Uh, the sloth the armadillo, and the anteater are all toothless mammals. Now, it's been said that the sloth is really slow, and it is true. They are really, really slow. Their metabolism is really slow. There was a movie years ago called Zootopia. I don't know if any of you saw it or not, but one of the characters in that movie were sloths working at the DMV, the Division of Motor Vehicles. And I, I know you are probably too young to be licensed drivers yourselves, but when you become a licensed driver, you will undoubtedly have to wait in a line at the DMV for some reason, whether to get your license, to get your license plate, get your registration for your car, no matter what it is, you're going to have an experience with the DMV. And by the way, if any of you or your families work for the DMV, I mean no disrespect to you when I say this, but when in that movie, the main characters went in the DMV and they saw sloths behind the counter, I and many other adults in the movie theater burst out in laughter because we could relate to the long, slow lines at the DMV. Now, I, I have to admit, in fairness to those of you that might work at the DMV, you have gotten much better in the state of New Jersey until the coronavirus hit, and then it got much worse. Last time I had to go to the DMV, I waited in line for six hours outside the DMV before we could even get into the building of the DMV. Uh, but that's a story for another day. But why are sloths noted for being so slow? I think one reason is because they are toothless. 
And the diet that they consume is primarily leaves and twigs. And imagine not having teeth and you had to gum your food. It's going to take you a long time to gum your food with no teeth. So perhaps their entire digestive system is accommodates that slow eating speed. Armadillos, they look really cool. Uh, I have a brother who lives in Florida, however, that uh, they, they love to have a garden, he and his wife. And they have told me that armadillos exist down in Florida, kind of like squirrels exist up here in New Jersey. And armadillos can wreak havoc on the uh, the garden that you might be growing because they just gnaw on all of your vegetables that you might be growing in your garden. But I've always been fascinated with armadillos and how how when they are threatened, they roll into a ball. I mean, look at those pictures of the armadillo rolling into a ball. That is so cool. It's kind of like a turtle crawling into its shell. And finally, the anteater, they have a rather long proboscis or a, a snout with a tongue at the end of their mouth so that they can put their long mouths into ant holes and use their tongue to to uh, slurp up the ants, which is why they're called ant eaters. All right, number five, that kind of leads us into the next group here. The trunked mammals have noses that are, well, really long like trunks. The elephants certainly, and there are different species of elephants, but the elephant certainly the most famous example of a trunked mammal. The taper is also another example. But elephants, on the end of their trunk, they actually have finger-like projections that enable them to grab onto small things like peanuts, for instance, or other things as well. But they, they use their trunks almost like a fifth limb. Wouldn't that be cool if we had noses that long with little finger-like projections on them. You know, imagine sitting at the uh, the lunch table in the cafeteria and you see, you know, somebody across the table from you has a cookie that you want to eat. You just kind of nonchalantly look over that way and your nose just, woo, picks it up and brings it to your mouth. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, anyway, we, we don't have trunks, but elephants and tapers do. Number six are hooved mammals. Hooved mammals include pigs, horses, camels, rhinoceroses, and giraffes. All of these animals have hooves on the bottom. They don't have feet like you and I, and uh, they, their hooves are almost like separated feet. And you can look up more information about hooves, uh, but they're, they're very interesting uh, foot arrangement for uh, for these hooved animals. Number seven. Number seven, we have the gnawing mammals. Gnawing mammals are noted for gnawing and chewing on things very, very frequently. The mouse, rat, chipmunk, and squirrel all of these are gnawing mammals. And, uh, you know, if you've ever had uh, something in the pantry, cupboard, garage, I don't know, wherever you might keep certain types of food, if you've ever been uh, in, if your house ever welcomed a mouse at some point, uh, mice do love to chew on things and they can you know what? This is really disgusting. But you know what I've seen? I've seen a lot of things in my life, but I used to live one place where it was infested with mice. We didn't live there very long, got out of there pretty quickly, but we put mouse traps out. And uh, uh, you know, these sticky traps, not a good idea. Mouse traps with the uh, the spring, much more humane and safe for killing mice quickly. Okay, because I've seen mice 
get stuck in one of those sticky traps. Very inhumane, in my opinion. And they don't die right away. And to try to preserve their lives, they literally will gnaw off the leg that is stuck in the trap in order to release themselves and stay alive. Think about that for a moment. Ooh, how nasty. Gnawing off your own arm or leg if it were stuck in a trap just to get away. Woo-wee! Well, that reminds me of another story. I think it was about 10 years ago, there was a climber, a mountain climber, out in the southwestern United States that was climbing, you know, a, a mountain, I don't know, maybe somewhere near Zion National Park. I'm not exactly sure where it was, but they fell. And they fell and their arm got wedged between the cliffside and a boulder so that they could not get out. But this climber had a Swiss army knife on him and he knew he was going to die. I mean, it was days and days without any rescue because I don't think anybody knew where he was. And guess what he ended up doing? He ended up cutting off his arm with a Swiss army knife in order to free himself to preserve his life. So who knows what even you might do if your life is literally threatened being trapped somewhere. If you don't believe me, I, I could show you the article in Reader's Digest. It was there. It was on TV as well. Google it and you'll see it. You, you'll see uh, this dude. I mean, uh, what a hero in a way to cut his own arm off. I'm just glad that his vacation didn't cost him an arm and a leg. <laughs> but uh, but I know that was really in bad taste, I'm sure. <clears throat> but all right, let's move on to the next one here. Number eight are the rodent-like mammals. Rabbits, hares, pikas, beavers, they're all rodent-like mammals. in the rodentia, the group of which these mammals belong, have to do with the, uh, the structure of their mouths, their feeding habits, and their physiology. These are kind of cute critters, actually. I, I, excuse me. Rabbits and hares, they're, they're really cute. And, you know, when I think of a hare, <clears throat> I think of things that I am lacking. Uh, actually, uh, uh, do you know what you call a line of 20 rabbits moving backwards? Trivia question. It's called a receding hairline. <laughs> All right, jokes are getting really bad here. Really bad. Let's move on to number nine. Number nine are the water-dwelling placental mammals. One of my favorite animals in the whole world are dolphins. Dolphins are, to me, they're like golden retrievers of the sea. It looks like they are always smiling and happy and playful. Uh, what a life to be smiling, happy, and playful all the time. But dolphins, porpoises, whales, these are all water-dwelling placental mammals. And that brings us to the final one, number 10. Number 10 are the primates. We as human beings are examples of a primate. Primates like chimps, gorillas, monkeys, and us are noted for our hands. We have what are called opposable thumbs. Thumbs that enable us to grasp a hold of things in a way that other mammals are not able to do. And the opposable thumb, as well as uh, the size of our brains, kind of set us apart from other groups of 
mammals. The primates typically are considered uh, the most intelligent of mammals, aside from some of the water-dwelling mammals like whales and dolphins and porpoises. They are considered the most intelligent mammals of the sea. Uh, and, and, you know, being able to train a dolphin, for instance, is a sign of intelligence. It can learn. They can learn. They do have a language of their own. So there we have it. We have our 10 groups of mammals that we've discussed today. And tomorrow we're going to do some lab activities, which will further explore this whole weekly topic of mammals. So until then, I'll say bye-bye.